Did you know that in Animal Crossing New Horizons, if a hive of bees drops out when you shake a tree, yes, you can escape by running into a building or trying to catch it with your net, but surprisingly enough, if you actually pull out a party popper, you can disperse the bees immediately. Now, whether you knew this one or not, this is an example of an in-game mechanic in Animal Crossing that very few people actually know about. And over the course of Animal Crossing history, there has been a ton of little nuanced things like this or other mechanics that have some of the most convoluted algorithms associated with them in existence, no matter what level of an Animal Crossing fan you are, chances are in this video, there's going to be a couple of really interesting mechanics that have just some of the most convoluted science behind them and it's really interesting to dig into. Let's take a closer look. One of the things that we've all experienced in Animal Crossing is different villagers having obviously different voices when you talk to them. Of course, all the creatures in Animal Crossing speak this animalese language, the official language of Animal Crossing. <laughs> And while at first glance it might seem like just some gibberish, there is a little bit of science tucked away in the way that the game synthesizes the sound used for the voice. In most of the international non-Japanese releases of Animal Crossing, the character voices use a voice synthesizer that's able to identify specific letters and letter combinations and then assign those to a specific sound so that there is some sort of consistency in the way that the language comes across when you're talking with a villager. The only big exception to this would be Animal Crossing Wild World, which released on the DS in 2005, and due to technical limitations, the voices in that game are based on a much more simple system, just basing each letter to a different type of pronunciation. <laughs> But if you look back at the GameCube version or the Wii version, this sound technology was there. More recently in Animal Crossing Pocket Camp and Animal Crossing New Horizons, even more improvements have been made to allow pronunciations so it doesn't sound as computer generated as before and support for different languages. So even non-English versions of Animal Crossing would have clearer sounding animalese. Also more recently to make each animal stand out as an individual character, there's a whole algorithm that goes into how the voice will come across. Now in the earlier Animal Crossing games, depending on your villager's personality, would dictate which voice type you would hear for the character. But in the newer games, they actually took it a step further, adding one extra set of criteria to adjust the voice, which is actually the species of character as well. So for instance, two villagers that have the same gender and same personality can sound different just by pitching one of them up or one of them down, which is a cool added touch for uniqueness. And you might not even realize this, but to keep every person's island unique in Animal Crossing New Horizons, there's actually a pretty deep algorithm going on in deciding probability for which villagers will have the potential to request to move into your island. Now this one's a little more common, so we won't dwell on it too long, but just to summarize the main idea of keeping things unique in Animal Crossing New Horizons, whether you're the type of person just to look at what villager shows up at your campsite, or you're the type of person to save up those Nook Mile tickets and travel to islands over and over and over again to try to get your dream villager on your island, Island, the existing configuration of villagers that you have on your island already living there does dictate and play a role into the probability of what villager will more likely present themselves as a potential move-in candidate when you have a spot ready to go or there's just someone at your campsite. It's definitely a little confusing and there's other videos out there explaining this really in depth if you're the type of person to go villager hunting for that perfect villager. But for instance, let's say you don't have a jock villager living on your village. If you travel with a Nook Mile ticket to an island to see what villager is there as a potential move-in candidate, the probability will lean in favor of presenting you a jock type villager. It's definitely not 100%, but it definitely leans into trying to get you to fill your island with someone that you're missing. It also accounts for what type of villagers you are seeing when you go, for instance, island hunting for the right villager. So say there's a cat villager that shows up on the island, but it's not the right cat villager that you want to move in, the probability of you getting another cat villager the next time you go is lowered significantly because you just saw a cat. This then branches out into a ton of other avenues, but still it's a really deep mechanic in Animal Crossing New Horizons. Okay, those are complicated ones. I promise we'd put a couple really easy ones in there, but did you know you can close the curtains in your house depending on what wallpaper you have? Yeah, did not know about this. 
It's kind of crazy. Way back when Animal Crossing New Horizons first came out in March 2020, while many of us were just taking our time, taking in the sights and learning about what mechanics were in Animal Crossing, some of us were taking things to the next level, figuring out optimizations and just trying to become billionaires as fast as possible. I just wanted to upgrade my house and get my debt paid off first before I did anything. So I was right there in the grind whenever there was new strategies being discovered to make bells quick. And as it just so happened, March ended up being the perfect season in game for a trick that manipulates the game's spawn rates for insects when you're on a Nook Mile ticket island where you could make absolute bank by turning any Animal Crossing island into a tarantula island. Now, if you don't know what tarantula island is, it's one of the special islands that you can get randomly when you travel with the Nook Mile ticket to one of the islands. And obviously, since tarantulas are worth so many bells, getting this island was a really big deal and a great way to get money. But when some players figured out there's a way you could turn any island that you get practically into a tarantula island, at least easily for the months of March and part of April, oh boy, was this a big deal for a while. And it still works depending on the season that you're in locally. As long as you don't get any other specialty island, you can completely manipulate the spawn rates of insects on the specific little tiny island you're on by essentially removing any of the locations that they can spawn in. Now this works best in March, though you still can increase the probability of getting tarantulas or scorpions just by doing this trick anyways. But since a lot of the insects will spawn out of things like trees or from under rocks, by removing all of these, you actually can change the odds or just remove them from the selection pool that the island will choose from when trying to spawn in insects for you to catch. Now, the way that these islands work is there's always a set number of insects that need to appear on the island at any given time. So by cutting down all the trees, breaking all of the rocks, pulling up all the stumps, essentially making this island a complete empty area leaves the game with less options of what type of insects it can spawn in. And since tarantulas or scorpions don't need a specific item to spawn in to exist, it chooses those ones more frequently. During the seasons, there's a couple other bugs that can spawn like this, like wharf roaches. And the time of day, especially if you do this in the evening, plays a massive role also in the spawning chances. And it just would turn out that way back when the game came out, evenings in March would make it where pretty much there was nothing but tarantulas. And all you had to do was just run around and you could just walk home with a full inventory of tarantulas every night. It was crazy, but a really cool way of quickly learning the way that the mechanics of the game work and then capitalizing on that. Now, of course, the easiest island to do this on would be Tarantula Island itself, or if it's the other time of the year, Scorpion Island. But as it turns out, each island that you go to visit also has its own probability associated with it and odds for you being able to get that rare island. Now, there's only a handful of different types of island configurations you can get flying with the Nook Miles ticket, mostly ranging from between 8 to 10% of getting any regular island, but there are special islands that are in that probability pool as well that you could potentially get with a much lower odds chance. Like for instance, Scorpion Island only has a 1% chance that you'll actually get it, and Tarantula Island only has a 2% chance that you'll have it. There's also a Big Fish Island that only has a 3% chance, and the rarest island of them all is a Gold Nugget Island that only has a 0.3% chance that you'll get it, but it can get you up to 8 Gold Nuggets. Now these special islands actually have a limit as to how many you can get in a day. You can only get these once per day, so once you've seen it, it removes itself from the probability pool. Now back when Animal Crossing first released, there was rumors circulating all over the place that if you applauded for enough times, a little Easter egg happens where he'll blush, which led fans to speculate that if you do this, they will send you to one of the rare islands that have the lower probabilities than the ones that have that higher 8 to 10% probability. Now, some people claim to have debunked this as not a mechanic, though I do have to say, if it was my first time traveling to a mystery island and I did that, I felt like my chances more often than not did end me my first attempt only in a nicer island, but it wasn't a guaranteed thing every time. So either one of two things happened, I was just incredibly lucky, or maybe it does up the probability of the rarer islands on your very first attempt only. If anybody actually knows the details as to what's going on in the game code to decide this, please do let me know in the comments down below.
Okay, let's talk about rocks. This might sound really random, but in Animal Crossing New Horizons, there is a system in place for deciding where new rocks will spawn if you happen to break your rocks open by like eating a fruit and just smashing them. Now, if you don't know this already, every single day in Animal Crossing, a new day starts at 5 a.m., which essentially means your island will fade to black, Isabel will read her morning announcements, and the new day of the island will be set up. Similarly, if you break some rocks the day before, there's gonna be some new rocks that spawn in, but there is actually a system in place on how rocks will respawn and you can manipulate where your rocks respawn based on controlling the layout of your island. Rocks can only spawn on a handful of types of surfaces like grass for example and if you fill your entire island with items and only leave a couple of spots open where rocks can respawn you can actually make yourself a little rock garden. If you're into gardening you could learn some of the crazy mechanics that go on when it comes to flower breeding in Animal Crossing games specifically in Animal Crossing New Horizons now there's already a ton of different mechanics when it comes to trying to breed flowers, but gold roses can be some of the most interesting gardens to try to grow in Animal Crossing, but they can be very lucrative as well. Now in general, getting the flowers you need to get gold roses in the first place can be challenging enough. You also need to have a golden watering can, but if you plant your flowers in an optimal cross pattern, you can have the highest chances of having gold roses spawn in in those in-between spaces if you water the black roses with a gold watering can. However, there is a way you can actually increase your odds significantly, which is by having other players join up on your game and water your roses with a gold watering can instead. There's some hidden mechanic in there that ups the odds for friendship, and I guess it just rewards players here who work together to make a bunch of money on Nookazon. Or you could just sell the petals, those are also worth a lot of money. When I played Animal Crossing, the original GameCube game, and sent 100 days in there, I had some wild things happen when it came to the turnip market. And you can still see some pretty big spikes in Animal Crossing New Horizons based on your turnip buying and selling abilities. The thing is, while at first it might seem like your day-to-day -day turnip price might be completely random, as it turns out, there's a deep algorithm in place in the background that chooses different patterns and situations that affect how turnip prices will go for that week. Essentially, fans have been able to crack the algorithm that's used for Animal Crossing New Horizons turnip prices using what is called Bayesian inference. Essentially, using what is called Bayes' rule, this algorithm lets you find the likelihood probability of something happening based on the information at the given time and the trend over time as new information is provided. Long story short, fans have been able to reverse engineer the turnip pricing model by tracking how the turnip prices had changed historically over time, concluding that essentially every single week, you can have one of four different trends with your turnip prices. However, whatever trend you end up getting may also be influenced by whatever trend you had the week before, so keeping track of your turnip prices every single day, week to week, could be a way to help impact your turnip returns. By listing each day into different phases, we can actually see the different types of patterns that you can potentially get with your turnips each week, and if you can figure out which pattern you're in in a given week, you can make the decision as to whether you should sell your turnips turnips right away or hold out for a better price. So these four main turnip outcomes you can get week to week is up, down, up, down, which looks like this throughout its week. You can have a quote unquote big spike week where you probably want to sell between Tuesday and Wednesday at that big spike as chances are the price won't get any better than that. The worst possible outcome is probably the decreasing one because it takes the longest to conclude that that's the week that you're in. And by the time you realize that you're in a decreasing week, you are in some trouble. You're probably looking at a loss during that week. But hey, if your price drops on Monday, you might be in the small spike outcome, which means you could sell on Wednesday or Thursday and see some decent gains. Now, I do have to say the process of calculating how to figure this out is way beyond my mathematical knowledge, but it's very impressive and there's a really great write-up by Michael Goldstein, which I'll put a link in the description down below that breaks all of this down. But after this breakthrough had been made, there's been some really great turnip calculator programs where you can just type in your turnip 
information that you have and try to calculate what your turnip prices can be. And this could result in you seeing some massive gains in bells in a week to week basis. It's all about selling at the right time. There's also a deep system in place when it comes to friendship in Animal Crossing. And user U Crossing actually put together a really cool visual explaining how friendship works using research by another data mine and researcher Ninji amongst others. But oh boy, is the system of making your villagers actually like you or dislike you way more complicated than what you might actually think it would be. And some things that you might have thought would maybe make a villager not like you might not actually be the case. Firstly, there's six different tiers of friendship built in for each villager on your island. And then there's a basic point system that's hidden away that you can't actually check that dictates some of the encounters you'll have with your own villagers on your island. Doing little things like having the first conversation of the day will get you one point closer to better friendship with them. And it can take about 30 to 50 points to level up each friendship level with each individual villager. Selling an item can get you a point, catching fleas off of them can get you more points, and doing other things like gifting them daily on a regular basis or doing little quests for them can help increase your friendship levels. By having higher friendship levels, not only will you get better dialogue from your villagers, but you gain the ability to interact with them more, like getting different and unique dialogue. They can give you gifts occasionally. They might give you a nickname. You could maybe get their framed picture, which is super valuable on Nookazon for whatever reason. Sometimes they'll even try to buy your stuff. That means that you're pretty close friends with your villager. Though let's say you have a villager that you don't like, and you just want to see leave your island, as far as we can tell, decreasing points with a villager doesn't actually increase the chances of your villager leaving your island in Animal Crossing New Horizons. So doing things like ignoring them or talking to them too much, hitting them with a shovel or an ax, it doesn't affect the points at all. <laughs> Though if you hit them with a net enough times, you will decrease your points with them by three. So shovels and axes, no good. And bug nets are the way to go. Now from there, the whole system gets way more deeper and convoluted where different types of quests get you different values of points, which could make your friendship level rank up even faster. You can get them certain types of gifts that they really like. And depending on how good of friends you are already, you can get even more points. There's a tier list earning system for how to give birthday presents on a villager's birthday. It's absolutely wild, but still really fascinating at the same time. Okay, this next question is probably one no one's asked before, but what happens if you you have 10 players all living on the same island and all sharing the same birthday. Well, as it turns out, YouTuber GameSam decided to test this along with testing a ton of other birthday situations just to see what would happen. And Isabel actually does change the dialogue once there's enough people all celebrating birthdays at the same time. And it's actually kind of silly. Now I know we've looked at some really confusing things that have existed in Animal Crossing, but let's look at some of the more simple ones that don't weigh too heavily in the overall scope of Animal Crossing. Luck is an interesting feature that's been in Animal Crossing for quite some time. Basically, if you talk to Katrina and get your fortune read, there's a variety of types of situations that can come out of good luck or bad luck. There's a couple of different outcomes that can possibly occur when you are getting your fortune read by Katrina. For instance, you can have better luck in some situations for things like your own belongings, with bells, with friendship, or with health, which essentially means villagers might want to sell you more things or give you more things. You might get more more really cool things bell related like from shaking trees or getting money rocks or maybe the level with your friendship might even go up randomly just from your fortune. Similarly you can get bad luck which would have negative impacts for you as well like villagers being less likely to sell you things. You're not going to get any bells from shaking trees or money rocks and maybe your friendship meter might decrease with one of your random villagers. This is just a really cool classic one that's been in Animal Crossing since the beginning. This is another interesting one just because we talked about the Nook Mystery Islands already Ready, but when they introduced Cap into the game with the Animal Crossing 2.0 update, they actually added new islands that you can visit by taking this little boat ride. And similarly to the special islands you can get with Nook Miles, Cap'n has his own probability of getting specific islands when traveling around. Just this time around, some of these specialty islands are a little bit different. Like you can get crops on some islands, shooting stars, vines and glowing moss. There's Money Tree Island, a Winter Island, a Cherry Blossom Island, 
island, and a fall themed island where you can get acorns, mushrooms, and pine cones. Without trying to fully fry all of your brains with different types of math situations and algorithms, you have to remember to play Animal Crossing. When it comes to the floating presents that appear above your island from time to time, there is, of course, an algorithm that goes into that as well, as not only does the color of the balloon dictate what your probability of getting a certain item in the gift box is, but also the different probabilities for things like DIY recipes, already known DIY recipes, different amounts of bells and materials, and even things like clothing and furniture have their own probability drop rates. And then there's also a different probability drop rate if it's your 10th balloon or later of the day. It's pretty wild. Now, back in the day when the older Animal Crossing games existed, decorating your house could actually play a big role into your overall luck mechanic when it came to Animal Crossing. If you utilized feng shui, which is essentially a Chinese practice where furniture and items can be arranged into a certain way to quote unquote increase the flow of positive energy throughout the house, you could increase your luck mechanic. Though in Animal Crossing New Horizons, while feng shui does have an impact in the game, it does not have an impact into the luck mechanic. Instead, feng shui continues to exist in the game, but it only relates to your Happy Home Academy score, which is kind of a little bit of a relief because if you want to throw your furniture wherever you want to throw your furniture, you don't want to worry about getting bad luck in Animal Crossing because of it. Though, for those who do want to put that extra attention to detail and decorate their house as so, they will be rewarded by getting better Happy Home Academy scores, which is something that's kind of neat. Well, that definitely was a lot of information to quickly learn in a short period of time, but it was a lot of fun to dig into some of these really nuanced mechanics that exist in Animal Crossing. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to this channel if you're new. 90% of our audience is not subscribed, especially as a new Animal Crossing channel. A subscription goes a long way. So even if you're on your phone or on a TV, I know it's like an extra step to help this channel out, but it does really support us and help us make more content moving forward. So maybe you could help us out. Also, we've done a lot of really interesting videos so far. Here's some of the ones we've done. Maybe check them out if you want to. But otherwise, that's it for today. We'll see you all next time with a brand new video.